Yes, sir. We are live. <clears throat> Welcome to Half Glass Gaming, a gaming podcast where the glass is not full. <laughs> We're in a bomb shelter right now. It's uh, one of those days. My name is Julian Watkins. I will be leading this discussion. I will be the Charlie Rose of this format. I am joined, as always, by the Reverend Rebecca Nathaniel. That would be me. I am the Reverend Rebecca Nathaniel Elf Princess. Yes. And uh, Josh. That's me. Yes. Take me to the subway, Josh. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And Mandy. Hey. (laughs) Yeah, welcome. We're going to talk some more. I, uh, I don't know. What's going on? What's going on in the world, folks? I've been seeing some weird stuff lately. Mm. I decided to watch anime the other night because this is how all great stories begin. Of course. You have, and, uh, well, first you have to decide. Yeah. So I was looking for a show to watch and then I see the text first person anime. Was this like, on Crunchyroll? It was on Crunchyroll. Of course it's on Crunchyroll. Yeah. I mean, where else would I watch anime, Josh, really? Hulu, but... Yeah, <laughs> But I saw the text first person anime, and uh-huh. so like I, I have to see what this is. And there's a show called Makura no Danshi, and it's first person anime, five minute episodes where a cute guy is lying in bed next to you, and it's a different guy every week. And so you get to sleep next to an anime guy and have him stare at you and talk to you. Wow. And my favorite thing about this, though, is that I read the like descriptions of the episodes. Two of the guys are professional flower arrangers. Like, this is this a thing like <laughs> yeah. how guys get with librarians or nurses is it like oh man gotta get in on those flower arranging guys yeah that was the weirdest thing yeah and then i was making fun of it to josh and then i felt really bad because i saw some review <laughs> somebody wrote it in there they're like i was so sad and this sweet happy anime like made me feel so positive about life and then i felt like the worst person in the world and then after that the next comment was super gross I felt not well, there you go. Again. Yeah, they bring it right back to it. Yeah. <laughs> I stumbled upon, I, I forget the name, Monster Mon Piece, something like that. Monster Masume. Monster Masume. Monster Mon Piece is the game we made Josh ah, that's, play where okay. you rub girls on the Vita. Uh, right. Similar. So, similar, <laughs> right. The It's a harem anime where all the girls who want to sleep with the guy are, in fact, some kind of folklore monster. Hmm. Like, you've got the, the Lamia, you know, the snake woman. Uh, you've got a, a mermaid. You've got a, a harpy. Mm-hmm. The worst part about uh, Monster Masume uh, is that apparently I have a snake woman fetish and I didn't realize it. Hmm. Excellent. I've been getting into a uh, Korean uh, drama called uh, Remember. Yeah. It is. Uh, it, it, it's at the same time. It's really great and it's completely awful. Does it do that thing where the show ends in a cliffhanger and then some dramatic music plays and like two different yeah. characters look up at the camera? Yeah. Oh, that's my favorite yeah. thing. Yeah, and then like K-dramas. for the first two episodes, they completely spoil the next episode. <laughs> It's like, here are clips that are going to happen in sequence, and that's a shocker, you know? It's like, what the... F- the worst part about Korean drama, uh, especially television shows, is the men, they cry so much in those shows. The main character in this show, yeah, okay, his dad was falsely accused of murder and rape and is going to jail, and the lawyer that he hired sc- screws him over to, you know, advance his career and save his relationship with his familial uh, gang boss uh, father figure. Okay, I get it. He shed some tears over that, but it's like, Jesus Christ, man. He's yeah, like Jack in season three of Lost. Hey, look, I come from the mean streets, okay? I'm <laughs> raised in a Madison, different environment. Wisconsin. All right? the, the mean streets <laughs> of Madison, Wisconsin, right? No, it's just weird. It's just weird how much crying the main characters do. And it's and it's like there's no depth to the emotion. Was Lee Min Ho in it? Lee Min Ho. He's probably most famous for Boys Over Flowers, but he's in a bunch of K-dramas, and he's just really good at doing that goofy, crumpled face, crying that- face, and having it being weirdly <laughs> endearing, but like he's making yeah. the, the stupidest face possible when he yeah. cries, and you sort of want to hug him. And so I kind of wonder if they don't write extra crying scenes. They're like, oh, Lee Min Ho looks so cute when he cries. Let's, <laughs> well, let's have him sob for no reason here. Like so. the, the dad that's on trial, he's also losing his mind, his memory. So he, he's got this perpetual look of confusion on his face. It's like no matter what's happening in the show, if he's in the scene when they cut to him, 
He does this weird thing where he like frowns, looks down, and his eyes dart back and forth, and he just looks off like he forgot to turn hey, off Maybe the they just wrote there. the whole plot <laughs> over the expressions they most like to see in the character's face. Yeah. So they're like, oh, I love, I love how that guy looks when he cries. Let's have him cry. All day. Oh, that guy is great at looking confused. Let's let's have him lose his memory so he could just look confused all the time. Yeah. I, this is going to be our biggest show yet. That, yeah. That's not uncommon. I mean, I know that a lot of scenes in Tom Cruise movies are written around the idea that Tom Cruise thinks he looks really good running. Yeah, he runs quite often. Yeah, so and so like he's like if you're going to put me in a movie too, you know. Right. It's not like he's just jogging. like if you're going to put me in a movie, you've got to write stuff around me running because I look great running. Maybe mm-hmm. Tom Cruise just hates going to the gym and so he's like <laughs> that way I can get all my workouts in yeah. on the job. Yeah, or there's speaking. Tom Hanks who wants to pee on the audience as near as I can tell. Like, can you think of a Tom Hanks movie where we don't see him peeing? I don't know. I, I never even noticed that he pees in any it, of his it, movies. The Green Mile, we've got a peeing scene. Uh, we've for got a whole p- mile. Yeah, right, for the whole mile. <laughs> no, in the, so uh, the Yellow Mile. The, the Green Mile, mile. we've got a peeing scene. In <laughs> uh, Castaway, we've got a pee. Like, uh-huh. in all his Road movies. He doesn't, he doesn't pee in my least favorite Tom Hanks movie. <laughs> Yeah, well, there you, well, there you yeah. go. If he peed, it would be a better movie. Which is my favorite movie of all time, right next to the he's doing a, he's, he's just waiting for the sequel, You've Got Pale. Of <laughs> <P>. <laughs> <laughs> what a Josh joke. Yeah. What about you, Subway? What you been up to? Yeah, a good old two-napkin Subway. I've been uh, playing a game called Roundabout. It was just, you know, on say, in a, like a flash sale on, on PSN. I had never heard of it. Mm-hmm. But it's basically like a B movie as a video game. And they do like, you know, FMV video scenes with the characters and stuff. But you play as a cab driver or a limo driver, but your limo doesn't ever stop spinning. Mm-hmm. It's like... <laughs> Whoa, really? It's like this woman has revolutionized the uh, the spinning limousine. <laughs> and so you're like... <clears throat> not invented, but revolutionized. revolutionized. So somebody else invented it's it, and then, thing, she, yeah. and then she took the invention and just made it worthwhile. Well, she 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 was the original one, and there, there's another guy, this like French dude, who's like trying to steal the idea <laughs> from her, and so she ends up like racing this guy, doing like a death race with this French dude. <laughs> because if someone wants to steal your spitty limousine idea, what else would you do? <laughs> and. uh you know, spoiler alert, but the French dude dies in this race. Of course. And it, it, it ends up going like full on anchor man and she's like becomes like this this hermit living away in the mountains and like all of these people are like trying to get her back into the revolving limousine business. Wow. And, and is uh, the is the soundtrack done by the band? Yes. If only. Mm. <laughs> But, like, the acting is deliberately bad in, like, a really endearing way. And all of the voice or all of the actors in the movie are just random game developers that were, like, friends with these guys. It's beautifully cheesy. It, it is so good. As opposed to Resident Evil, where the acting was completely accidentally horrible in an endearing way. It, it, it's it's so funny. Like, there's this one part where there are two kids that are just the kids of one of the devs in the back of the car. And, like, the one kid keeps mouthing all the kids' lines. Mouthing the other kids' lines. <laughs> but, like, no, like, we were watching it and just thinking about how much fun the bad acting is and how hard it would be to do something like that with voice acting. I mm-hmm. mean, not only would you not see it the kid mapping the other kid's lines but like I feel like you miss out on like the discomfort on their face but mm-hmm. like not a bad discomfort where like I'm not comfortable with this but this is really fun mm-hmm. you can get away with a lot more bad acting in FMVs than you can with yeah. voice acting yeah. And the limo driver never talks. She just, like, looks at the camera and makes expressions. And, and the dev vlog, they said they recorded, like, over two hours of her staring in different ways. <laughs> Weird. Well, I think uh, when you're seeing the acting, there's a lot more body language that you can interpret. Mm-hmm. And people are often very endearing and interesting with their body language. Uh, and, you know, have a presence with that that just doesn't come across in voice. Mm. That reminds me of the old uh, James Bond movies where a lot of the times they would hire somebody based purely on their looks who couldn't speak, like, proper English um, <laughs> or had really, really thick accents. So they would just dub him <laughs> in, in, in post, like the guy from Goldfinger. It's like not his voice. A lot of the women aren't actually using their real voices. It's like, <laughs> she's good looking, but man, she can't talk. You know, it's just <laughs> stick somebody else in there. 
No, because we mentioned it a few episodes back. Um, I did finally go through Soma. Mm -hmm. That's another fucked up game. It is another fucked up game. And like one of the weirdest things about it is like the voice acting. It's not bad voice acting. It's just like it feels badly directed. Mm -hmm. And it feels like when characters are supposed to react to something, they don't react to it. They just deliver the line. That's a reaction to the thing. And so it's it's really confusing. (laughs) They deal with some really fucked up shit that's going on and they kind of just blow it off. And so it's <laughs> it feels really weird. And yeah. even in the scenes where they're like talking about it and it's like, oh man, this is really fucked up. It like doesn't feel like a natural reaction to what's actually happening, no, happening like in the they, world. They talk about it's like world ending crazy stuff and they're like talking like they're standing around the water cooler at work talking about like what the weather is going to be like that weekend and it's really jarring and it's like a situation where the story on paper is a lot cooler than it comes across mm-hmm. in the game because mm-hmm. you can't really feel that invested in what the characters are going through because the performances don't really match what the characters are going through. Is that on purpose or do you think it's just I mean, see, directing? I could see it if just one character's voice like that, because if a certain character talked like that, I think it would fit. But mm-hmm. everybody sort of talks like that. And even some of the, you can like hear recordings of other people and even some of those feel really off. I could see it working in the context if certain requirements were met. And I, don't, I just don't want to spoil anything, but... I I don't think that it actually worked Mm -hmm. for the game. Mm -hmm. It was a great game, but it had, you know, things like that. It also it also had some really bad design choices in a few places. There's like four or five spots where where um because there's like stealth segments that you have to get through and they inserted like some monsters and stuff in there. And there's a few spots where it works really well, where the monster's creeping around and you're like creeping through these dark hallways and you you can like pick up things and throw it. And so like the the monster's blind and it's like stumbling down the hallway and you pick up like a tin that's like on the floor or like a you know you grab the mouse off of the computer and then you mm-hmm. chuck it down the hall and the thing goes and chases it so you can get around it like mm-hmm. stuff like that is really well designed but then there's a few other sequences with similar monsters where it feels like they just threw the monsters in because it was starting to get really close to being a walking simulator and mm-hmm. they're like we need some gameplay we need that's crouching in this yeah that's not we need to simulate crouching in this and throwing <laughs> but like there's one there's one scene where there's like a bunch of story elements and you like discover computer terminals and they have like me- you can read people's messages to each other and things like that and start piecing together the story there's like a whole room that had a bunch of stuff in it that I didn't even get to see Mm -hmm. because I was being chased by a monster. It's like, don't try to mix the exploration elements with the stealth monster elements. Like, it doesn't work. Like, if you want to have a sequence that's you running from a monster, great. But, like, don't have that happen in a spot where there's exploration story elements. You can't, like, sit down at a computer terminal and read people's messages to each other while a monster is chasing you. And so why would you put one in that scene? Like, it's, you know, decisions like that that were just really weird and felt really out of place. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that that really only happened four or five times throughout the game. Well, with that, I think I'm going to take the opportunity to call a break. As always, I, you know, want to give out a, a shout and a thank to uh, 2XAA and Wheelie and Aaron Voltenson and uh, my main man, Jimmy Mamadas. You know, uh, listen, Half Glass Gaming Season 2. And we will be back after this break, and we're going to go into a discussion uh, about uh, voice acting. Thespian style voice acting. <laughs> <laughs> just really makes me want to shake my bottom and shake my bottom i did so here we are voice acting it's been uh requested non-stop you can finally you know put your megaphones down and uh sit back and relax because we we're going to plug your ears with facts about voice acting yeah ever since we did an episode on sound design it's been like our number one most requested episode was was voice acting yeah so uh, let's get this started. Let's, you know, let's start at the beginning. Early examples of voice acting. 
Well, I think a lot of games started out using voice synthesis and so mm-hmm. not voice acting. So they would create a program that could simulate voice, mm-hmm. sort of like the HAL voice. Some sort of a simulation. Yes. I see. So uh, there are two games that came out in 1980 that use speech synthesis. Mm-hmm. One of them was Stratovax, which was a title game released in Japan. Mm-hmm. And the other one was Berserk, Berserk. which is a, a very, very interesting arcade game. I hear that's a dangerous game. It could say 30 words. It cost them about $1,000 a word. And one of those words was chicken. So it was <laughs> made by a company with their priorities in order. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the word chicken is going to cost us $1,000 or putting it in this yeah. game like, <laughs> worth that's, every penny that's yeah. a company that you can you know put your trust in yeah. damn it jerry <laughs> if this game doesn't say chicken <laughs> yeah i mean berserk is kind of a crazy I'm game gonna though. Go berserk. yeah <laughs> berserk and chickens aside I, evil auto it still gives me nightmares because of the time in which i played the atari version of berserk I was just at the right age that having this smiley face suddenly pop up on screen because I'm taking too long was fucking terrifying. Yeah. Berserk's designer, Alan McNeil, ha- he had, had previously worked a job where there was a security guy named David Otto. Hmm. And he was like a nightmare to work under. <laughs> And I mean, my impression, and this is this comes from you know three decades of people talking about this, and probably urban legend and whatever. But it sounds like this this David Otto guy was really into like very Orwellian like security practices, and was always like the worst guy on the security he team. He said like they'd lock them out of the building for an hour for lunch, so like you had to leave the building and you would be locked out for the whole hour, and he'd play like really terrible music and like. <laughs> Type it in so everybody had to listen to whatever crappy music Dave Otto was into at the time. Wow. I wonder if it was (laughs) (laughs) auto-tuned. I was going to let that slide, but I couldn't. (laughs) And so when when he named the creepy smiley face thing that chases you around, essentially Evil Otto pops up when you're you've spent too much time in a maze. And so he comes out and chases you and he can go through walls and you can't kill him and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so so it is it's terrifying and it's a way to get you to to move faster through mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. Evil Otto was named after a security officer. Huh. Uh, the craziest thing though about Berserk it was the first video game to be tied to player deaths, or at least attempted to be tied. Real life death. Uh, yeah, real, real life, life death, there, yes. There are three rumored deaths and two <coughs> confirmed deaths. I wow. mean, so three in total, two of them are confirmed ones. Ah, just a gotcha. Apparently a player went in and posted a high, a high score of 16660, and then immediately had a heart attack and died. And then a year later, one of this guy's friends came in and played the game and had a heart attack and died. Mm. And then several years later, there was a fight, apparently over a quarter that had been inserted into the Berserk machine, Mm -hmm. which ended in uh, one guy stabbing another to death. Mm -hmm. And so- um, Logical. You're right. The That's first, the yeah. very, the very first one, the the six, the the six 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 death, is almost certainly an urban urban legend. Mm-hmm. And plus, like, that's not even a, high, a very high score in Berserk. And so... Yeah, that sounds pretty uh, meager at best. Right. And the whole 666 thing is... It, it, it all has the trappings of an ur- urban legend. Yeah, it's what a, what a coincidence that it used the number of the beast from the English translation of the Hebrew text as opposed to any other, you know, religious iconogra- iconography from throughout history. Mm-hmm. Well, that's typical Berserk fashion. Yeah, well, uh, right. Uses Christian iconography. Yeah. Yeah, Evil Otto. Was, you know, that's the book of Acts, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the looks everyone gave me. It was like, she gave you a look. I gave her a look. I was, I was waiting for at least one person to say, edit point, <laughs> and no one did. No, yeah. the only thing I thought was, stop, don't open that door. <laughs> Although as scary as terrifying as Evil Auto is, Sinistar. I am Sinistar. Well, Sinistar was the first game to use stereo sound, and they actually did hire an actor for that game. He was a radio announcer. Mm, I was going to say, was it Tim Curry? No, no. Oh. Although, let's be honest, it should have been. Yeah. 
I mean, any part that could have been Tim Curry really should have been Tim Curry. No, it was radio personality John Dormus. Wow, that's a terrible radio personality <laughs> name. Best known for his radio syndication of The Passing Parade, a series of short stories of remarkable but relatively known episodes throughout history. So, no, he was just some radio guy, and they roped him into doing the creepy voice for Sinistar. Hmm. And the thing about that is I don't think his performance is probably very creepy, but the sound quality is so poor that Mm. kind of everything he says is terrifying so yeah so they're actually now recording voices and they're pumping them in the games what year was sinistar february 1983 so it it didn't take too long to go from voice synthesizing to actual voice acting yeah because berserk was 1980 but i mean this is still the arcade right yeah um home council wasn't really quite there yet i don't know about the atari the first home console that i could find that had voice acting was actually there was a module for the intellivision called mm-hmm. the intellivoice mm-hmm. and it was a cart that you could add on to add voice to games that were designed around that but it did really poorly there were only five games released for it but that was in it was discontinued in 1983 and released in 1982 hmm. so one, one was, of them was bomb squad right Yep. I thought so, because I remember uh, my a friend when I was growing up had an Intellivision and the and you know the voice thing. And Bomb Squad was fucking great in my you know six year old mind. Uh, you were just there trying to defuse these bombs, and it was fun, and there was this voice, and that made it nifty. So like the voice, what did it do? What did it add? Uh, it just said stuff like hurry and danger. Like, yeah, it was mm-hmm. really basic stuff, mm-hmm. but, you know. Chicken. <laughs> yeah. It did not say chicken, so well, it that, failed on that front. Obviously, that's why it no longer is a popular form. Yeah, right. That's why it didn't do very well yeah. if it had said chicken. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, for me, like, I recall the Nintendo era punch out stuff. The like punch that. out's the one I really remember being aware. Mm-hmm. And I mean it's not like they said anything interesting, but it was no. a voice for what you're doing. So body slam, right hook, uppercut, body slam, well, for body me, slam. It, it, when it really blew my fucking mind, Super Metroid, the intro when they're kinda of going over the story and it sounded like an actual like woman's voice and it was right. clear and crisp. I was like, Whoa I grabbed my brother and I shook him. <laughs> <laughs> In in the 16-bit era, it, it did get a lot more common. And then going back to Bubsy. <laughs> Bubsy. Everything goes back to Bubsy. Everything, right. Yeah, everything revolves back to Bubsy. It was an influential game. Yeah, people. But Bubsy is the center point of much of the threads of fate of video game history. Mm-hmm. People like to not give it credit for things that it did now that we have very clear hindsight of where that franchise mm-hmm. was headed. But, I mean, it did a lot of interesting things. But Bubsy was one of the first, you know, console games in the 16-bit era to do, like, really extensive voice acting. Because mm-hmm. Bubsy was always talking. <laughs> That's true of cartridge games, but even as early as 89, there were a lot of games with voice acting on CD consoles like the Turbo Graphics. To be fair, the reason I try to deny Bubsy's place in history was because it used all that voice acting to make puns even worse than what you you and Julian make. And therefore, I just like to forget it existed. Mm. Sonic didn't have a voice. Mm, not in the original games. No. He, he no. just tapped his foot at you mm-hmm. angrily. Sonic CD had a song, like a, an anime video in front of it. and hmm. a, a whole song. I feel like the um, CD era was mm-hmm. where voice acting well, really just started taking off. They couldn't do actual voice acting aside from sampling until they had CDs because well, there was so much data Conquer to put in the... a good deal of voice acting. In well, it, that was, but that was much later in the cartridge era. Yeah. I mean, CD-ROMs existed in the 80s. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by that point, they could have big cartridges with lots of data, but mm-hmm. they couldn't at the point when CD-ROMs were first developed. That was when they first had enough space to actually do voice acting. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think one thing that you could say, though, is early voice acting was relatively par for the course terrible. I mean, it depended on the game, but a lot of that was really bad. I mean, part of it is like studios like Sierra that mm-hmm. had always done everything themselves decided that they could still do that for voice acting. Mm-hmm. So it's like a group of a couple of guys being trying to do all these crazy fantasy voices and yeah. making it work. And well, like, shit, oh. Bethesda still does it. Crap. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, they get one or two big names, and then everyone else is the same three voice actors. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there also were a ton of issues with localization, because translating a script 
is one thing and that's what people had always done with localization but when you have to translate a script and come up with a dub that dramatically increases the cost of localization mm-hmm. and so there are a lot of games with really good voice acting that wound up with really terrible voice acting when they got brought over uh, yeah this isn't a beloved game but uh last alert on the turbo graphics which was released in 89 in japan in 1990 here mm-hmm. had uh probably is some of the worst voice acting ever in a video game it's famous because one of the guys mispronounces the word stingy what does he say stingy stingy he <laughs> says people will hate you steve if you're too stingy <laughs> <laughs> the damages on this ship and the weapons aboard will come to a billion dollars people will hate you steve if you're too stingy Nobody Being even stingy. allowed themselves to be credited with their name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, they just say, like, first name, and they just seem like made-up first names, and nobody even knows who did these voices because they're so bad. But, like, famous voice actors in Japan from, like, beloved franchises did all the voices in the original yeah. version. Yeah. And uh, subtitles for video games weren't that much of a thing. Almost everything got dubbed. Yeah. On. So the first time I was really aware of voice acting as a thing, thing didn't come around until the uh, PlayStation era for me, which, mm-hmm. you know, obviously there was 16 big games that had voice acting. Uh, but the first game I like really was cognizant of it as a thing uh, was Star Ocean The Second Story, which is one of my absolute favorite uh, console RPGs. But the voice acting, it was just so, so horrible. And the localization was horrible, mm-hmm. such as the the main protagonist's name was Claude. But there are lines where he mispronounces his name. So he'll say stuff like when he levels up, Claude has advanced forward. <laughs> One of the most famous ones comes from a character whose weapon is a gun. Mm-hmm. And when she's going into battle, the dialogue line is, I will turn you into a beehive. The fuck does that even mean? My Julian's guess, face during I mean, that my, plan was great. My <laughs> guess is that somehow the original translation had something to do with, like, filling you full of holes because, you know, she's got a gun. Mm-hmm. And somehow it was, like, made a comparison to a honeycomb or something. Well, the guy was eating honeycomb cereal. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was just so terrible. But it was also really endearing because it was so terrible. Mm-hmm. It's like... You guys are so bad at this. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to be turned into a beehive. So. Yeah, right. No, no, like who would? Yeah. <laughs> Look, if you turn into a beehive, you have no choice but to be stingy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know. I think for me, like, the first time voice acting kind of really became a, um, something to pay attention to was Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, I mean, Metal Gear Solid was phenomenal, especially for the late 90s and mm-hmm. the PS1 era. I mean, you're jumping off of things like Resident Evil, which yeah, is right. notoriously bad. I want to say Mega Man 8 came out the same year mm-hmm. as as Metal Gear Solid. Mega Man 8 was released in 1996. Oh, so I was, I was way off. Mm-hmm. Well, and how can you compete with Dr. Wiley? <laughs> you must recover all the energy immediately, Mega Man. But where is Dr. Wiley? That's a good question. We may be able to locate another energy emission from the radar room. When we find that media, we'll find Dr. Wally. Mega Man 8, the English voices were recorded in Japan and they didn't bring in American actors for it. Mm -hmm. They used English speaking actors who already lived in Japan. Well, they weren't even actors. Uh, yeah, they, they were, were just, just people who spoke English people. in Japan. So mm-hmm. these people weren't necessarily fluent in English, yeah. weren't necessarily actors, and got hired to do a voice acting job. So I would say, though, once it transitions into the PS2 era, um, that's when you start seeing this focus more on like celebrity um, voice acting? Well, celebrity voice acting has been a part of video games almost as long as they... Well, not as long as they've had voice acting, mm-hmm. but since it's gone beyond voice sampling, Tim Curry was in a lot of adventure games in the early 90s. Probably most famously, he was Gabriel Knight, which is Tim Curry playing a Cajun detective. <laughs> Excuse me, but your eyes are really distracting. I don't think I've ever seen a color quite like that brownish gold. It's so deep and rich. It is not a good accent. Well, yeah, I guess. But he he, he kind of kills it. 
Yeah. That, was that a full motion? No, video? Gabriel Knight became a FMV game later on, and then they recast Tim Curry because because right. he wouldn't do the video. But mm-hmm. when it wasn't an FMV game, Tim Curry was the voice of Gabriel Knight. Because mm-hmm. there were somewhat famous people that kind of popped up in the FMV era. Yeah, that was one thing I actually wanted to ask about because I know Mandy, you have a lot of experience with FMVs. What was the FMV games doing with not just voice acting but actual acting? There were more games that with voice acting before FMV games became really popular. In like the late 80s, early 90s is when voice acting started to be used a lot. And FMV games didn't start to become really big until 94, 95. Mm-hmm. But um, what was really fun is that a lot of old adventure games for the PC were re-released with voices. And they would put Taki Edition <laughs> on the box. Like that happened with uh, like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, yeah. the adventure <laughs> game. Although I like that because people compare the history of video games to the history of cinema a lot. And I mean, it did change Mm -hmm. video games and storytelling and what they could do, sometimes negatively and sometimes positively. Mm -hmm. Look at the box, Dan. Is this one of those talkie games, (laughs) Shane? They they actually tried to get Harrison Ford for the talkie edition of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and I guess it came really close to happening, but it didn't at the last minute, so they got a Harrison Ford impersonator. But the voices are good, and that came out in 1992, so. That's hilarious. Um, There was a a Path of Neo video game on the PS2. Obviously, they couldn't get Keanu Reeves. Um, So they got Andrew Bowen of Mad TV fame, who had impersonated (laughs) Keanu Reeves in many a sketches. (laughs) It's absolutely hilarious. He's also in Fox Hunt, the FMV uh, Fox Hunt game. (laughs) I guess you could say that, yeah, um, larger name celebrities, uh, well, not larger, but celebrities. um, Skinnier. B, C, maybe D listers um, had been in doing voice acting in games for a while, but it seemed like the PS2 era is when a lot more B and A list heavy hitters were starting to do some game work, most notably, you know, Grand Theft Auto, I think, once they transitioned into the open world game with three going on to Vice City and then San Andreas. I mean, they had celebrities for days in those games. Phil Collins was in one of them, okay? (laughs) Samuel L. Jackson, uh... Ray Liotta, I mean, relatively impressive. I remember reading, like, reviews of, of GTA 3 and, mm-hmm. you know, them mentioning some of the voice talent. I was like, there's no, there's no way they got all of these people to be in a video game. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. they did. Oh, yeah. What's his name? Uh, Michael Rappaport. You know, but I think it got to a point where it was a detriment, where they were just throwing money at large names to get him in games. But being a good actor on film isn't necess- doesn't always translate into being a good voice actor. Well, and that's something that has come up in a lot of, um, like, animated movies as well. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll try to cast big names. Final and- Fantasy. Right. Final Spirits Fantasy. Within. The Spirits Within happened. The Smurfs movie. <laughs> Which, you know, if it wasn't for the bad voice acting from the celebrities, would have just been a, a, a classic. It would have been. If it wasn't a talkie. Right. It could have been a talkie. <laughs> mm-hmm. They will think that star power equates to voice acting ability. And it, it really doesn't. I have a uh, friend uh, who does comedy music who also is a professional voice actor. In fact, uh, the K.O. Pectate commercial, the Uh-Oh, he did that. So you like Uh-oh. you you've probably heard his voice. That commercial he, spoke to me. I'm sure it did. It said, "Uh oh." Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like he's gone on about the, what's involved in voice acting, and it is such a different skill from acting. Acting. Mm-hmm. You know, now the actual sort of like voice acting talent that we have in games that aren't necessarily known as being celebrities outside on film um, have become famous and celebrities in their own right. I mean, mean, Nolan North's on Pretty Little Liars, so there you go. Oh, well, well, there you go. (laughs) You made it, kid. (laughs) And let's be honest, Nolan North is video game voice acting at this point. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. He's the Andy Serkis. Um... (laughs) I don't know how to make that reference, but he's the Adam <laughs> circus of Adam Sandler's of Carlos Menzies. Let's, let's just let's just say that Nolan North is the master of unlocking. Yeah, Troy Baker. I mean, it's like those right. two dudes are pretty much it. Call or Bailey if they have to put a girl in it. Mm-hmm. If they have to. You're right. And they can't get Nolan North. <laughs> <laughs> Who, let's be honest, would have would have played a great Ellie if they yes. got Nolan North yeah. for The Last of Us. <laughs> well, Nolan North was in The Last of Us. 
But, you know, they couldn't dual cast Nolan North as whatever part he was could, and Ellie. You could make an entire game of just Nolan North. You could. Yeah. Actually, now I want that. Yeah. I want a game I mean, he was North. the motherfucking penguin in in the Arkham games. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> I, didn't, I now want that. I now want some game where Nolan North does all the voices. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of Nolan North and, you know, even going back to what we said just a few minutes ago about celebrities, the Destiny kerfuffle is still in pretty recent memory. Uh, So originally there's a character in Destiny voiced by Peter Dinklage Mm -hmm. and people did not like his voice. Like as much as people love Peter Dinklage, he's a great actor. Uh, he was not right for that role, and it was very clear. Yeah, it was very wooden and sort of just stilted. I mean, I guess he thought he was playing a robot. Yeah, I mean, it basically got to the point where it was so bad that they just called in the old Nolan North. That old hound dog got him in there and uh, got Peter Dinklage the fuck out of that game. So I think what happened was the character was going to show up in more DLC and whatever. It was going to be a, a more important part of the game. And mm-hmm. so, um, I mean, for everything that I've heard, and this is from Bungie, it, you know, employees and things. And so it might it might be more PR than whatever. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like their official statement is that. You know, Peter Dinklage has a really, really tight schedule. He's doing a lot of work. And if we need him to come back and redo a couple lines, you know, it might be three or four weeks before he can make time to do it. And we need someone who can just come in on a moment's notice Mm -hmm. and and do these lines so we can get them right for the game. Mm -hmm. And Nolan North has been doing video game voice acting forever and is in everything. And so in the studio already. Right. And so he's got a little cot in the back. (laughs) He's just more fit for doing video game mm-hmm. voice acting. And so from Bungie's side, it sounds like it didn't even have anything to do with, you know, his performance mm-hmm. not being good. Uh, from a fan perspective, that's what it sounds like it was yeah, all about. I, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I saw a comparison video where they took key lines and kind of put them side by side. And yeah, I mean, it was for me, it was like night and day. I just think here's a character. You hear this voice. Um, the last thing you want is like something that is very droll or annoys you. You know, the adverse to that would be like Bastion, um, where it's like the narrator is the, is the game. The game. You know, you got to have like charisma and uh, a dulcet tone. and uh, Or the, the Stanley parable. Like, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's like Ron Perlman delivering the lines in uh, Fallout. He didn't. He didn't say it in this new None one. No, 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 no more. Never actor. changes. I was. Yeah, I what was a the, bummer. And it's weird because he was the news guy on the TV before the bombs fell. So they got him in the game. It's, it's not follow unless yeah. he says war. War never. He's. He has to be the one who yeah. says it, or it's just it's yeah. not a follow game. It's non canon. It's oh, like yeah. tales with their mothership titles and their offshoot titles. Fallout Four is just a spin off now. I was actually. <laughs> I was actually deeply offended. And disappointed, actually, when I heard it was just the guy doing the regular voice. I mean, I didn't even play as the guy. So it's just some random dude who who (laughs) Who dies dies. in the first minute of the game. (laughs) (laughs) What's even weirder, speaking of Fallout, was Matthew Perry in in Fallout New Vegas as uh, Benny. I I played that game for countless hundreds of hours, and I never knew that that was him. Could there be any more (laughs) radiation? (laughs) (laughs) There it was. I was waiting for someone to say it. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, I always thought it was hilarious in Fallout 3. Liam Neeson, as your father, it's like I played a black character. So my father was black, voiced by Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, that's it, it, Bethesda all over. They get these really, like, big names. And, like, it's not even the the big name, why did you get this person? Because they're, <laughs> they usually are perfectly functional voice actors. Yeah. You know, Liam Neeson was fine in Her, voice yeah, acting. Yeah, he was great. Uh, Patrick Stewart as the Emperor in Oblivion. Mm-hmm. But so they get these names, and they're like... So how could we use these names for as little time as possible and then have the same five actors to do every other voice in the game? Yeah. <laughs> well, 
it's maybe they just wanted to get pizza with Liam Neeson. So they're like, yeah. well, we'll get him in the studio one day. It won't be a lot of work. So mm-hmm. then he'll go out and get pizza with us afterwards. <laughs> we can meet Liam Neeson. It's a sweet <laughs> deal for us. It's like how all Adam Sandler's movies are an excuse for him to take vacations with yeah. his friends. I, all Bethesda's video games are an excuse for them to get pizza with <laughs> celebrities that they like. Yeah, and I, they stop Jeremy Piven. You know, there, there are worse reasons to hire these people. Well, I think what's cool about voice acting... Um, um, when it's good, it just sort of adds this new layer um, to the game itself. Well, I fully agree that when it's good, it really adds something. Like, mm-hmm. so, you know, the first time I was really cognizant of the voice acting was Star Ocean, the second story, and Resident Evil, both of which are known for not having good voice acting, mm-hmm. which is true of most games that had voice acting in the PS1 era. Like, it just, it wasn't that great. Well, actually, I saw a panel that uh, DC Douglas was on and some other some other professional voice actors actors were on and dc douglas does the voice of albert wesker in i believe resident evil 5 and later but he he talked about the original resident evil and how you know back in the 90s in these japanese studios you've got people who don't really speak english and so they're they're picking from takes based on what sounds the most appealing to them rather than what actually sounds like the english language yeah. and so they'll do just do a bunch of takes and like open the door open the door open the door and then they'll just pick whichever one sounds the most appealing mm-hmm. to them as as a non-native english speaker mm-hmm. and so that's basically what happened with as Resident opposed to like what reflects the situation of the character itself i hope this is not chris's dialogue <laughs> <laughs> but uh and they have english voices in the japanese version of resident evil which is biohazard but uh nice it's yeah. the english voices are it's english voices in both countries mm-hmm. so that's entertaining I recognize that it's not great voice acting compared to some of the voice acting we see now, but Final Fantasy X, uh, for the time in which it came out, had genuinely good voice acting. You know, mm. the voice actors managed to make each character's way of speaking like a character mm-hmm. trait as opposed to, oh, I'm just reading dialogue. Uh, and, you know, it, it had its stumbles, but... It was overall very well done. Final Fantasy X is a really interesting case because they used lip syncing. And so when they localized it, they had to translate the game around the lip syncing. So what do you mean by lip syncing? I mean that characters' lips matched what they were saying in Japanese. So they had to make all of the English lines be able to match the movement of the mouths on screen. Which Hmm. is, it's amazing that the game wound up with a under understandable script at all yeah it could have been like a bad lip reading like yeah well i don't think that was was anime too yeah Mm -hmm. but um the most controversial choice is this is a spoiler for the end of final fantasy 10 but at the end of the game in japan yuna says arigato uh thank you to titus but uh in the american version she says i love you Hmm. and part of it is because lip syncing it matches up perfectly but uh part of it's also because saying i love you in japan is very different from saying i love you here and how you use it and it's very normal to say it in really indirect ways and the writer of final fantasy 10 agreed that i love you is a good translation but uh this is a thing i learned from my teacher at fictional high school in persona 4 so when i went to high school in japan in a video game my english teacher taught me this but uh there is a Japanese novelist and translator named Soseki Natsume. He used to translate I love you in English books into the moon is beautiful, isn't it? And he would argue that that should be the standard translation for I love you. Because it's just that's how they speak in Japan. They try to find an indir- a super indirect way to like imply something. And because it's such an indirect culture that they can understand that. Mm-hmm. It would be uncommon for her to have said I love you in that situation. And, but the translator felt like that's what she really meant. And the writer agreed. So, mm-hmm. But people are mad about that to this day. Because they'll say, oh, she should have said thank you. It made perfect sense. It's because they never went to Persona High School. They yeah. know. 
if, if they'd gone to video game high school, they would yeah. they would know this. That's that's a thing with localization altogether, actually, because it's not just can I translate what the person is saying. It's can I actually translate it so that it means the same thing in this culture's language. Well, I mean, same thing for film. Christ, you're looking at the old uh, kung fu movies, you know, um, from the 60s and the 70s. It was like trying to match up dialogue that made sense to fit the lip syncing. Right. You know, I mean, it's like the language is so so quick when spoken that it's like here, it's like, we have to look at the house. We have to look at the groceries, you know. It's like- <laughs> no, I, I was actually just been playing a game with Chinese voice acting and the tone, of, the rhythm and tone of the language is so different from anything I'm used to hearing. I'm really, really used to hearing English and Japanese mm-hmm. because of video games and media, but I don't hear Chinese spoken that often. And the rhythm is just so different. If you're trying to match it up, it's just so different from the way yeah. people naturally speak here. It's it's really weird to hear a game in Chinese at all because... I think that was one of the biggest letdowns for um, the local localization of Yakuza series is that they went with um, English actors not anymore though not anymore right but i mean like originally it was kind of like you know i love mark hamill but the hell is mark hamill doing no i mean i feel like any game where it's it's set in a real world area and the setting is really important to the story you just really shouldn't dub it Mm -hmm. uh one of my favorite games of all time shenmue is dubbed and i really don't think it should be and not because of the quality of the acting though it's not good and i won't try to pretend it is (laughs) but because you know it's small town japan and then small town china like why why is this in english when the culture is such a big part of the story it's really jarring Mm -hmm. As an example, the films uh, Night Watch and Day Watch, Russian blockbuster movies, basically, uh, if you do want the um, English dub, they at least got Russian voice actors that spoke English, so they had Russian accents Mm -hmm. delivering the English dialogue. Yeah, which at least had like this small level of authenticity to it. Yeah, you know, because like playing like Mad Max, the game Mad Max, it's all English speaking actors doing these really awful Australian accents. (laughs) Yeah, to the point where it isn't even like recognizable. Us, it isn't even like over the top. Like, hey, mate, I'm Australian. You know, it's like (laughs) this weird sort of like mimic (laughs) this bizarre impersonation of australian accent that just doesn't even come off as australian it's ridiculous like if if it's something like final fantasy you know it's a made-up world it's fine to dub it Mm -hmm. but if final fantasy suddenly became persona and was set in tokyo i absolutely would argue that they shouldn't dub it i think that's reasonable Mm -hmm. i mean you know if the culture is important. It's important. Yeah. It doesn't become less important just because some people don't like to read subtitles or some people don't like to acknowledge that countries outside of the United States exist. Mm-hmm. I, you know, look, we miss. I'm sure we missed a couple things and we'll be called the task on that. Uh, By the taskmasters in yeah. the comments section. Yeah. Who don't mask their tasks. They uh, rake us over the coals as it is, but uh, they have a voice and they like to be heard. And that's the that's the beauty of voice acting. I think, you know, voice acting has come a long way in games. In, in certain circumstances, in, circ- in certain instances, the voice acting really can save or even make the game. Um, there have been times when it can break it, uh, you know, break the immersion, take you out of it. There are cer- still game franchises that don't even really rely on full voice acting like Zelda. Um, Mario is just a stereotypical, insulting uh, depiction of a <coughs> Italian plumber. Mickey Mouse is an Italian plumber. <laughs> it's really it all comes down to Pac-Man, I think. But uh, and how Pac-Man was really just a uh, remake of Castlevania. <laughs> but we're in this uh, arena um, right now where you know I think voice acting has kind of come into its own and it's uh, really become an art form. But that isn't to say that it's necessary. I mean, there are games without voice that can even, that that also instill um, these emotions and bring them out of us. Games like Journey. So it's an interesting thing. You know, it's an interesting part of game design. Plus, minuses, you know, it all equals fun. <laughs> and with that, I'll say thanks for joining us. Half Glass Gaming out. It was like he made a Jill sandwich.
I told you, I am going to shove them in, and I am not apologizing. There's, yeah, you're just you're just making Resident Evil jail sandwiches out of with no bread. Yes, I am. <laughs> Nothing but jail. Nothing but jail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like oh, yeah. where that one went. <laughs> Peanut butter jelly.